Uh, much of the motion capture process was already detailed earlier, so I'm just going to go with the stuff that's relevant for game. Um, in this case, since we had three unique characters, and also we would be doing multiplayer and in a game filled with, with melee combat and swords and sorcery, you want to make sure that all the characters can, can sit down and have three unique, you know, more or less, motion styles. Um, so I went through and went to the lab several times, and eventually made about 30 or so animations, um, roughly 10 to 12 per character. Uh, to, to make sure and distinguish them, obviously depending on the fighting style. For the for the warrior he was and he uses a big sword, so pretty much all of his motions were, were melee centered. Um, the mage, actually most of his effects were to be range weapons and particle effects, so all I had to do in that was get a broom handle that was in the motion capture that, that I just used to take place in the staff, recorded all the animations with that, and most of them were, you know, swipes or little hand motions or just kind of whatever came to me at the time. The rogue was more of an interesting mix of the two, since some of hers were melee and some of hers were ranged. Um, so after I got all these motions captured and, and then brought them back into the lab from Vicon, um, I was actually looking forward to this part since I remember doing motion capture two years ago, where we had to take each animation and map it to an actor and then map the actor to the skeleton. And the whole process took around two to three hours for any one given animation. Fortunately, um, through the updated versions of Icon and Motion Builder was going to be a much, much, much faster way to do this. So um, once I had a single pipeline going, each animation ended up taking about five to ten minutes to run through, which was a, a wonderful relief from the previous time. Um, so as you can see, this is, this is a screenshot from Motion Builder. The large yellow skeleton is the raw data that was captured from uh, Vicon and the Motion Capture Lab, whereas right? so this little skeleton right here, I think, is the, the warrior skeleton. So what we do is go ahead and characterize the yellow skeleton, make it move around, then go ahead and characterize the white skeleton, match the two up, and apply one to the other. And soon enough, our skeleton for our, our uh, model was following the yellow one about as clear as it could be. Next slide. So um, once we've got all the, the motions in, it was time to go check in on our, our level one art designers so here. There we go. So I'm going to turn it over to Devin and uh, Danielle. Uh, I'm, I'm Danielle Robinson, and this is Devin. And we chose uh, at the beginning of the project to sort of be the level design group, level and environment group. Um, we had a really clear idea of what we wanted from Trey's uh, story. He wrote a 10-page PDF on the, the world that we were, we were playing in. So when we started, we knew we wanted a, a dark, a medieval feel, and we knew we wanted an arena pit fighter, like two or more pawns going at it together in one field. So we started out with a, a simple ring, just a, a big square, uh, and it was going to be a graveyard. And through playing it, we found out, well, this is, this is too small, it's no fun, our players are always right by each other. So we expanded it, made it a bigger, a bigger field. We surrounded it with uh, static meshes to keep the players in the arena. Uh, and we, we tested it some more. And then we find out, well, this is really bad for melee characters. I mean, ranged characters on the other side of the field shoot an arrow, hit your melee character 10, 15 times before you're even to them. So our solution for that was uh, gravestones. Since we're in a grave, graveyard and other meshes, we scattered them throughout the level in hopefully aesthetically pleasing places. Uh, and gave them collisions so you couldn't run through them and you couldn't shoot through them. So that would provide lots of uh, areas to hide for the melee character, but for any character to hide and prevent being damaged, you know, run across the graveyard and hide, hide somewhere and hopefully save your life. Um, originally, models, uh, models created uh, are not created to detect collisions. So if you transfer them into the Unreal Editor, they're, you go straight through them. Uh, Unreal, Unreal will auto detect some models for you if they're really simple, they're really low polygon count, and most importantly, they don't have any concave shapes in them, uh, curves or semicircles. If you have any of those, UDK is not going to build the collisions for you, you have to build them yourself. Uh, after research, I found out that you can build them in art uh, editors like Autodesk 3DS and Autodesk Maya. Uh, you can literally take and get pictures of boxes and place them around your model and name the boxes a very particular name and import them into UDK and UDK will recognize, oh, this is a bounding box for this model. And so you can use one or two or uh, in the most case, 
the, the most complicated model we have is our crypt, and that took, I want to say, 26 different bounding boxes uh, to, to get all the collisions to work correctly. So that, that took up a lot of my time, is getting collisions to work correctly, and there's always, there's always problems. So I finally had all the gravestones. We have six gravestones total that made correct collision measures for all of them. Uh, some of them had little curvy pieces, so I had to account for all that. We put them in the level, and the characters run up to the gravestones when they stop, but you can shoot projectiles straight through them. So we had to do some research on that, and it ended up to be one variable uh, collide, collide on a per polygon basis uh, had to be set for true. And once we fixed that, that, that basically fixed all of our collision problems and we went on to the rest of the collision meshes. Uh, and so that's, that's basically all I have to say on collisions. I'm going to hand it over to Devin to talk about our particle systems. Okay. While we were waiting for the models from the artist, I went about looking into getting particle systems in our level. And due to the jury aspect of not only the level, but the entire game, um, first looked into adding rain to the level. Unfortunately, UDK did not, does not have an actual rain system, but it does have rain splashes, water mist, and lightning. So I started looking at tutorials online and started with something simple, like a fire tutorial, which we were able to actually add into the level, the, the final level. From there, I went on to actually building the rain particle system. And fortunately, uh, UDK does have a built-in emitter property to simulate rainfall, so that helped out a lot. And I was able to use the material from the rain splash particle system as the rain drop. <coughs> so that saved me some time as well. Uh, we wanted a heavy rainfall, but we ran into a problem in that the spawn rate wouldn't increase past a certain amount, so it looked like a result, which we did not want at all. Um, basically, after much searching around and just messing with the control, I had to end up linking several particle systems together for it to work properly. The rain splashes also suffered from the same issue. Fortunately, the mist system, the water mist in the level, did not, but that was able to be easily edited. The built-in lightning system within UDK, it's really useful. The only thing is that it spawns a lightning bolt just directly where the emitter is placed in the level. So instead of putting several emitters randomly around the level, I added a large cylinder within the particle system so it would just drop random bolts just within that particular area. And I ended up placing an emitter on each side of each of the four sides of the field so it would have a distant lightning in the background. When I wasn't working on particle systems, I was working on these static meshes with, that UDK provided. Most of them had to be edited color-wise in order to properly fit in with the theme of our game. Most of them were very vibrant and green, which didn't work out. Uh, this was fine when editing within the mesh's original package. You could easily change the colors. But the problem was that we had set up our own, our own package that we could Mainly Danielle and I uh, moved between one another, so we could work on separate computers. And the problem with this is that if something is used in the level, everything associated with it has to be placed into this package. And things like static meshes and particle systems will reference, normally reference a lot of different assets. So I basically have to copy all of these to our package and uh, update all of the reference paths so that it would properly work. This worked fine until I did start working specifically with the materials on static meshes and that you couldn't actually change the path that it referenced. So the first workaround that I had was that I would grab the material that I wanted <coughs> from the content browser and drop it right onto the mesh in the actual editor. This worked fine until I was working with one of the trees in the level which it has three materials attached to it, bark, leaves, and vines, and I wanted to get the dead leaf effect. Unfortunately, it turned into a tree made of dead leaves and big So that didn't work. 
we almost had to just forego using these assets, but I was able to find the permanent solution, which was exporting the file and then re-importing it. And this allowed me to directly change all, all the materials on these static missions. I'm going to hand it off to Luke to talk about the UI. Uh, I'm Luke Gomez, and I did the user interface for Immortal. Um, as you heard from the pre previous group, there's two ways to do user interfaces in UDK. Uh, use a canvas or scale form. Scale form requires Flash, and I didn't have access to Flash, so it was a tough choice, but I went with Canvas. Unfortunately, Epic has been removing support for creating user interfaces with Canvas in every update of the UDK. So it was interesting to go through forums trying to find solutions that allow me to use Canvas. I eventually uh, found out that Creating a menu and a user interface requires to you to have your fingers in a lot of different parts of the UDK. Um, I came up with a solution to create a new level, and this would load the uh, menu, and from that you would able be able to load the actual gameplay level. So I thought, if I'm loading level, why not use the level we're actually using gameplay for? And I can make a nice overlook uh, that you're overlooking level, and you have the menu on, menu on top of that. Unfortunately, levels require a player, and since I wasn't overwriting the entire screen with my menu, the player was then loading his own HUD and his own crosshair onto the screen and covering up everything, and he was spawning, and the player was going into his view instead of my scenic overlook, and it was all a mess. So I was like, okay, I'll just take the camera away from the, from the player and put it up in the sky, but that still left his HUD and the crosshair, and you can still move the player around. So I was like, I'll just kill the player. So I put the player underneath the level, like he respawned. I was, like, so I was like, I'll put him way above the level. Of course, you can see where that's going. It's just comically the player just spawned and fell to his death as you watched. I was like, oh. I was like, I know, I know. I'll just trap the player and take away his gun. And with some clever code, I hit his HUD instead of the menu. So you saw our menu. There was no crosshair, and you couldn't kill the player. So everything was fine, dandy. Oh, uh, so I knew how to make the process. Everything was going to go well from here on out. So I was like, okay, so what do I need to make for the menu and user interface? Talked to my group, found that out. Uh, design the interface, go to the artists, say, okay, I need these things, and then I implement it. Uh, no problem. <sighs> things changed. <laughs> By the time I got through the whole process, requirements had changed. We were now doing different things, or things were being cut from the game. So I had to go back and rework everything. Uh, what I took from this is that the UI is an iterative process. You make something, then remake it. And also I apologize to all the artists that all the artwork you gave me that I cut out. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but that was about my experience with uh, UI. And I'll hand it to Phil for the postmortem on Immortal. Um, so a lot of this uh, background I like to took the class a few years ago, we were using Ogre which is the open source graphics rendering engine, and which requires a lot of work on your part just to make it run. Um, the, the only thing it has is libraries. There's no user interface, there's no UK editor, there's no networking built in, there's no preset game weapons, anything. Um, everything you do has to be come in and has to be brought in and built by you. So a lot of the original class was spent figuring out over making a game engine doing all the things that we learned, learning the ins and outs of the process. That didn't happen this time. Um, the Unreal Editor is a powerful tool, um, and one that, you know, there's a, a lot of help and documentation out there for, but without getting such an intimate knowledge of the original source uh, that we were using to make our product, things became a little crazy whenever we were trying to do something that Unreal didn't want us to do, or that it didn't like us doing. You know, it's it's great working within the confines of, of Unreal because you have the editor, and you have Kismet, and you have all these wonderful ways that they tell you how to do things. But if you're trying to do something outside of those bounds, you're going to run into a lot, lot, lot of brick walls, especially when it comes to editing Unreal Script, which no one, more than one of our group members complain about. Um, we didn't manage to get a, a usable product out of time, um, so now we're going to move on to the demo portion of our event. Um, I think we require a minute or two of extra setup. So I ask for your patience. Uh, yeah, that's just 